So welcome everyone. Uh, I'm just going to begin with a brief comment. Um, my name is Isabel de Carries. I'm the Chair of Trustees at Moray House Trust, and I was the convener for this panel. Moray House Trust began to organize panels in uh, 2015, when the sugar industry was in peril. Since then, we have hosted dozens of panels on sugar, oil, gas, the Constitution, and much else. Our aim is simple, to facilitate public discourse. In Guyana, unfortunately, this is not a straightforward task. On Friday 1st March, we invited Exxon to participate in today's panel to give a 10 minute talk, responding to a few general questions about their role in the project and in gas extraction and refining generally. On Friday 8th March, as in yesterday, after multiple follow-ups and requests for confirmation, Exxon emailed to respectfully decline the opportunity due to scheduling conflicts. They had presumably spent the intervening time canvassing each of their staff of several hundred, and I quote, individually and by pigeon post. Exxon is arguably within their rights to decline an invitation from Moray House Trust or any other civil society organization. <laughs> Indeed, according to their employee, they receive a deluge of these requests every week. However, there are a few points to be made. First, the way they behaved in this instance verged on the dismissive. It suggested a measure of arrogance or contempt, the large corporation toying with the tiny nonprofit. Mm -hmm. It's a well-worn tactic to keep these invitations pending until the last possible moment and then duck out. We have endured this sort of playground politics since we started this process almost a decade ago. Our patience is wearing thin. Second, there are broader issues at stake. A Moray House Trust panel, or indeed any panel worthy of the name is designed to offer a variety of perspectives. If major players like the government or the lead actor in a billion dollar public project repeatedly refuse to engage, the discussion is skewed. Failure to engage perpetuates a bifurcated discourse of boosters and naysayers. Positions become entrenched and calcify. This does little to advance public discourse. And by the way, we have now conducted these panels across several political administrations and the failure to engage has been a feature common to each. In future, when organizing panels, we will continue to reach out to groups, corporations, and government agencies who might be able to shed light on a particular topic, because that is the proper way to proceed. However, where we repeatedly encounter refusals or last minute regrets, we will also prepare, as we have done today, a list of questions arising for public dissemination. Whatever it takes, the discussion will continue. I'd like to hand over to uh, Liz Dean Hughes now, who's going to host the session. Thank you. Good afternoon, all. Welcome. Um, while we wait for a few others to join, I would just like to go through some protocol and outline the format. Um, so, uh, um, first, uh, the speakers will give a brief synopsis of their arguments. Thereafter, among the three of us, we will have a discussion. And thereafter, it will be open to the floor to speak um, for, for you. This um, meeting is being recorded, but only up to the question and answer part. And that is in, for the protection of privacy. 
Jose, as Isabel said earlier. Um, so please feel free to fire us and fire the panelists with questions. So good afternoon and welcome. On behalf of Moray Trust House, we are here at this power play assessing Guyana's gas to energy project. For those joining us for the first time, Moray House is a privately owned trust, nonpartisan, nonprofit based in Georgetown. Moray House for over a decade has been promoting culture and public discourse in Guyana. It was founded on the belief that a culture thrives and develops uh, its ideas when it circulates and their discussions. My name is Elizabeth Dean Hughes and I've been a, an advisor to the board for some years. A warm welcome to all our regulars. Panels have been a regular feature of Moray House since 2015 and they're intended to serve as a way of encouraging critical thinking and exchanging ideas. Today, we resume the whole um, review of the gas energy project some two years later. We, are, we have hosted earlier in the oil sector, the oil and gas and environment. It was held in June, 2022. And there was a pros and cons discussion on the gas energy project in 2021. No apologies are being offered for revisiting this topic at this point in time because they have been new information coming in that is worthy of careful consideration and needs greater scrutiny. We will begin by looking back at an energy project um, that has been in our past, which is the Skeldon Project Factory and the cogeneration plant. Mr. Raw Lucas has kindly agreed to review this and guide us through this. Mr. Lucas is an economist at the University of Guyana and was a former chairman of the Guyana Revenue Authority and the Guyana Power and Light Company. We will continue with an assessment of two papers, one by an American NGO and the other by the government of Guyana. Dr. Thomas Singh will provide this analysis. Thomas Singh um, is the director of the Green Institute at the University of Guyana, it's UGGI. He's also a senior lecturer in the Department of Economics. As a director of UGGI, uh, which is a body that focuses on sustainable and inclusive development um, uh, in a resource abundant country. He has contributed to policy designs, both in microeconomics and in macroeconomics and in related matters. As an active member of society, he is the founding and immediate past president of the Epilepsy Foundation of Guyana. As Isabel mentioned earlier, we had invited ExxonMobil to participate in this panel. Unfortunately, they sent their regards yesterday. We believe that there are important questions hovering on this project over which they are the only ones who can answer. Um, given the lateness of this response, we've adopted um, a vacant seat policy and a clip with outstanding questions will be shown in this period. It was great pleasure. I invite Dr. Lucas to the floor. Please, Dr. Lucas. Enlighten us. Um, Liz, good afternoon, Isabel. Um, good afternoon, my fellow panelists, uh, Thomas. Um, and good afternoon to the entire audience, many of whom um, I know, either as colleagues or former colleagues, and others whom I know as students of mine at the University um, of Guyana. Um, <clears throat> I would, I really appreciate this uh, invitation uh, from Moray House because I believe um, the issue that we are addressing you know, is of significant value to the, uh, not only the discourse about the quality of the projects that we are looking at, but also the implications that the way those projects are being addressed have for our public accountability issues of 
uh, public finance and, and transparency. And so I hope um, through this presentation, which I will make this afternoon, um, offer some thoughts, which would allow us to have a conversation about, um, you know, how we can perhaps improve the circumstances um, in which we operate, as well as the um, ways in which we could perhaps get um, our public officials to um, respect and, and respond um, to the thoughts that we might express. I'm not expecting uh, total agreement with anything that I say um, in this presentation, but I believe it offers um, an opportunity for me to learn, and, uh, particularly um, about the um, elements relating to the gas to energy uh, project, as was mentioned. So what I'm going to do is I do have a, a, a slide, a PowerPoint presentation, which I will uh, put up on the, on the board. And um, hopefully I can go through it fast enough um, to the satisfaction of the organizers and the viewers here today. Um, I don't know if you can read the slide, but what this first slide points to is the fact that um, some action is already being taken on a gas to energy project, um, which consists of um, a gas pipeline to be laid, um, a pipeline um, offshore and onshore, a wharf and a power plant. Um, concerns have been raised about the viability of this project and apprehension about new sources of power supply in Guyana is not new since concerns were also raised about the viability of the Mela Falls hydroelectric project. And if these concerns appear heightened today with respect to the gas to energy project, it could be because of another failure, the co-generation component of the Skeldon Sugar Modernization Project. While the co-generation plant is spoken of in the context of the Skeldon Sugar Modernization Project. It was a standalone project built to produce an estimated 30 megawatts of electricity. A cogeneration plant is a facility that produces electricity from a single principal fuel source. It can produce both electricity and, and heat. Gaisuko was the sponsor of the project and had experience with cogeneration technology except that the supply of electricity from cogeneration was always for its internal use. The ambition of the new cogeneration investment um, to which I'm referring was to expand the supply of electricity by Gaisuko to the national grid. 10 megawatts of electricity supply from the new investment were earmarked for the grid. Guyana is now trying to build a generating facility that is 10 times the size of the Skeldon Bagas cogeneration plant. Mr. Lucas, sorry, could I just interrupt? Could you put it on full screen? We've had a couple of requests from the audience. Some might be on a, a small screen and struggling to see. I, I see. All right, let me. Um, Thank let me you. Get to the, it's... Let me get to the. Sorry about that. Right. No, 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 that's all right. You uh, can. We can try to enlarge the screen. It's the bottom. It's the bottom icon on the right. Yeah, keep scrolling along. Next one. This one, huh? No, next one. The one after that. Yeah. Oh yes. Okay. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. Um, is that better? Yep, yeah, that's wonderful. Much better. Mm -hmm. Okay. So thank you very much. And so, given our experience with a smaller project. I felt that it was useful to, uh, you know, compare the progress, the process of the two projects to gain an appreciation of the likely rewards or risks from the new gas to energy project. 
But before undertaking the comparison, I wish to make some general um, observations. Now, though Guyana has had no great success so far with the special energy projects, each new project has grown both in size and complexity, along with doubts as to how much this country has learned from those experiences. For example, it should be noted that each investment in terms of intended, intended electricity supply is larger than the previous one. The Amela Falls project that is following the cogeneration project was 165 megawatts or more than five times larger than the cogeneration plant. We now see that the GTE project is seeking to produce 300 megawatts or twice the output of Amela Falls. Further, each new project depends on a different energy source. The cogeneration plant was largely dependent on bagasse, while the Amela Falls project is relying on hydropower. Now the newest project is relying on gas. Taken together, the three projects represent a generating capacity of nearly 500 megawatts from different energy sources. With the costs known or suggested, it should also be noticed that the unit cost of each project measured by megawatts has gone from 1.7 million per megawatt for the cogeneration plant to 6.1 megawatts for the hydropower plant to 8.3 megawatts for, for the gas to energy plant. Considering the poor track record of trying to scale up electricity generation in this country at high cost, including the current efforts to build the GTE, the panel discussion today is not only timely, but also necessary. It carries significance for public accountability and public financial management in the energy sector, as indeed for all sectors. Why and how public funds are spent are essential to good governance, transparency, and public accountability. So it's against this background of relatively limited success, varying energy inputs and escalating cost that I intend to present a comparison between the GTE project and the cogeneration plant. I must remind the audience that the cogeneration plant is an old project that has already been completed and the gas to energy is a new project that is still under construction. Consequently, the comparison will not include comments on the performance of the projects. Instead, it will be limited to the process used in arriving at a decision to undertake the project and the factors affecting implementation of the project. The most appropriate tool to search for similarities and differences between the two projects would be the life cycle of each project. Borrowing from the discipline of project management, I will use the life cycle of a project in this presentation the life cycle refers to the activities of an investment from design to the delivery of the project. For this presentation, it will be collapsed into four phases, namely defining and designing the project, planning the project, implementing the plan, and finally completing the project. I will also identify the parameters that will help with the comparison. And they are the timeline, completing the project on or before the deadline, quality, completing the project with the desired impact, and cost, ascertaining if the project was completed within budget. In the case of the gas to energy project, I will, I will compare the cost being touted against what the most likely cost will be by the time the project comes to fruition. Three other factors to make this armchair assessment useful are the role of the client in defining and designing the project, the alignment of the outcome of the project with the interests of the client or beneficiaries, and whether an attempt was made to test the proposed strategy to determine if the project met the objectives or could meet the objectives of the client. Admittedly, this presentation also benefits from information already made available by Booker Tate which is the company that represented the client, World Bank, 
uh, financial analysts, letter writers, and opinion presenters. The, this presentation also benefits from information already made. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself there. Uh, starting with the Skeldon Sugar Modernization Plant, we can see a dependency or chicken and egg situation that created risks for both the sugar factory and the coal generation plant. The bagasse of the sugar factory was the main input of the coal generation plant. And the output of the coal generation plant was the energy input for the sugar factory. This dependency relationship meant that without electricity, the factory could not uh, work. And without bagasse, the coal generation plant was not meeting its performance standards. However, independent of the travails of the sugar factory, the coal generation plant had its own problems. And those are the issues that I will address. Um, who was the client of the, the project? Let's start there. The government was identified as the client of the uh, Skeldon Sugar Modernization Project as it was with the um, Bagas Coal Generation Project. However, the coal generation component had two beneficiaries, Gaisuko and GPL, both owned by the government. One beneficiary was internal and seen as the principal um, beneficiary. The other beneficiary was external, but was given a marginal role, if any at all, in the design of the project. Now, so even though we had those two beneficiaries, um, it appears to be the government's interest more than that of the two entities for whom the work had to be done that seemed to take precedence. Um, even though, now, for example, the selection of a contractor for the sugar factory, um, which was which was based on a recommendation coming from Gaisuko, um, was rejected um, with no real justification. And worse yet, GPL had little say in the design of the plant, even though it was the entity with the greater expertise on electricity generation. The result was a product that was unable to serve fully the needs of the two beneficiaries. And then if you were to look at the objectives, every successful project must have clear end results objectives. There was confusion as to what the end result objectives were. A World Bank report entitled Guyana Investment Climate Assessment published in 2006, indicated that the reliability of electricity supply in Guyana was low. It was seen also as a critical obstacle to economic growth. Focusing on the needs of the two beneficiaries and the electricity situation in the country, one would think that the end results objective of the cogeneration plan would have been to provide the two beneficiaries with a reliable supply of electricity. However, this was not the case. According to one of the project information documents provided by the World Bank, the objective of the cogeneration plant was given as to mitigate climate change and achieve carbon credits. In other words, the motivation for the project was not consistent with what was required by the beneficiaries. One can begin to understand how objectives that contradict the purpose of a project could also affect the definition, scope, and outcome of the project. It meant that the real factors that could have made the cogeneration project a success were not necessarily fully considered. The ill-defined objective suggests something else. Before developing a project of the size and scope of the cogeneration plant, it is essential to test the preliminary strategy and answer the question, Will the project meet the objective of the client or in the case of the cogeneration plant, the beneficiaries? To test the strategy for a project of the cogeneration type, it is advisable to conduct a feasibility study. I have not seen a feasibility study, but understand from 
um, a Starbrook News article of March 2003 that one was done in 2001. The Starbrook News article also indicated that the feasibility study informed private investors that the cogeneration project was not attractive. There could be many reasons for the low return on investment, but the failure to attract private money reinforces the contention herein that the purpose of the cogeneration project was likely falling short of its goals. Turning to the three parameters of a project, I will start with quality control. The cogeneration plant was unable to deliver the service promised or even in the manner intended. Two crucial points emerge here. One, the plant was dependent on bagasse as its primary fuel source to function at optimal level. The bulk of the bagasse, 88%, was expected to come from the new Skeldon factory. Failure of Skeldon caused by the unwillingness of cane farmers to adjust their production methods and expand output was never assessed as a risk to the success of the cogeneration plant. Two, this plant was sold to a company called Skeldon Energy Inc. after it was reportedly commissioned. Owners of SEI observed in 2017 that the boilers installed in the plant were not suitable for the conditions in Guyana, clearly a quality problem. Also, the boilers used unfamiliar technology that were nearly four times larger than that with which Guyana was familiar. Guyana's readiness for this technology was questioned in one of the appraisal reports of the World Bank. Another issue of quality relates to the piping used in the circulation of the pressurized steam. The piping frequently malfunctioned and was not meeting its lifespan. The issue caused the plant to be regarded continuously as a safety hazard. A letter published in the Starbrook News of March 5th 2004, reinforces the view that the performance standards of the materials and equipment used in the project were not carefully followed. The other parameter of interest is that of the time frame for the project. The cogeneration project got started in 2005 and was expected to be completed in two years. However, the project was not handed over to the government until 2008. This represented a delay of, of at least one year. Marion Haynes in his book, Get From the Idea to Implementation Successfully, points out that meeting the deadline of a project would most likely be achieved by people who have experience with the activities of the project. Therefore, planning out this aspect of the project is critical to success. The fact that the project exceeded its deadline supports the contention that the contractor chosen for the job had no or little experience with such a project. To overcome such a problem, the contractor should have hired people with the relevant knowledge from the outset. The one year delay clearly suggests that this was not done at the start of the process. Success or failure is often measured by the cost of the project. The main function of the project budget is to monitor costs and prevent cost overruns. So I'm talking now about the, the budget issue. To achieve this goal, it means that the budget must be realistic. And a budget can only be realistic if the timeline of the project and the factors addressing quality are realistic. Such a view is logical since properly estimating costs requires knowing how long the project will take and the kind of materials to purchase. We have already seen that both time and quality were not met. Other factors with an impact on the budget are poor preparation of the work breakdown structure, inflation, lack of farm prices from vendors and contractors. There's no evidence that the other variables were properly, any of these other variables were properly controlled. Exchange rate movements were not an issue because the transactions were in USD. But I think it's important to point out that the appraisal of the project by the World Bank had observed that there were several technological barriers that would require a significant degree of organizational change 
and um, in, 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 in the development of the um, capacity to operate the power plant. And those changes were seen as having a major impact by the World Bank on the capital investment cost and the operational cost of the project. Um, again, it is not evident that um, these costs were considered as the project was being um, de designed and, and developed. Then, of course, um, <clears throat> for the, the appraisal of the project by the World Bank, um, no, let me, let me, I think I've repeated that. I do not have the details of the frequency and timing that monies were withdrawn for use on the, on the project. But based on the terms of the loan, a minimum cost um, for constructing the project would be in the range of 52 to $55 million. The cogeneration plant, plant was sold to SIE for US $30 million. This project and sale of project period 2005 to 2014. I do not know if anyone was ever held accountable this financial debacle. A new electricity generating facility is being built in Wales on the West Bank of Demerara. This facility will rely primarily on natural gas as its fuel source. This facility um, is to be supported by an offshore pipeline, an onshore pipeline, as I pointed out earlier, a natural gas plant, and other enabling facilities. Though each component can be developed on its own, the various parts must be able to work together for the project to meet its objective. Recognizing that this project is in various stages of development, there are, like in the case of the cogeneration plant, um, gaps in the information. However, one can still use the life cycle model to form some judgment about the worthiness of the project. At this stage, I can only talk about um, a few issues. The client of the project, the objectives of the project, and the cost element. Information from the project structure leaves one guessing about the client of the project. The centerpiece of the project is the power plant and the natural gas facility. Only when the capital structure of those two aspects of the project is fully known can that question be answered as to who is really the client of the project. According to existing data on, on the required capital investment, um, the, the, the capital required for the investment is close to $800 million. I do not know how much equity the government will invest, but according to the project structure, the government is supposed to invest some money in the project. However, if the other contributing partners to the investment will have the greatest share of the capital expenditure, they will want to ensure that the project objectives are clear and that the project will meet, um, to, will be, the objectives will be to their satisfaction. Given the fact that the capital structure is still unknown, one really and truly does know at this stage whose interests are really being met. In addition, the pipelines to transport the gas to the plant and the supporting facilities are under the control of Exxon and its partners. Guyana must pay to receive benefits from that investment, which means that its cost must be added to the investment of the project. Further, one can conclude that GPL will largely be responsible for transmission and distribution of electricity, since it has not been earmarked to operate the facility. Also, Note that by the time the gas to energy project fully comes on stream, demand will exceed what it can supply. Consequently, GPL will still be required to generate some electricity. However, if the demand for electricity does not grow significantly, then many of GPL's generating systems will become idle. It is not clear if this situation has been factored into the cost of the project. It is important to consider the end results 
objective of the project and whether it aligns with the interests of those dependent on electricity. On this occasion, the objective presented by spokespersons of the government has identified um, has been identified as the reduction of electricity generation costs. But I'm sure many here will agree that a reliable supply of electricity would be an important objective as well. Unreliable electricity supply drives up the cost for the consumers of electricity and creates too many uncertainties and inconveniences for which um, we, we are seldom compensated. Low production costs do not necessarily mean that the equipment and materials used to build the facilities will be of the standard required to ensure reliability of supply. Cheap rather than reliable might be the guiding principle and that does not necessarily give us the best results. Transmission and distribution systems also will have to be upgraded to ensure reliability. Again, there is insufficient clarity on this issue. It should be recalled that a gas pipeline in the USA was hit by a cyber attack that halted gas supplies for a number of hours. Has the project taken such risk into account? We don't know. It is noted that the preliminary strategy was not tested since there is no evidence that a feasibility study was done. Without such a study, we would not know if the project could meet the stated objective of lowering the price of electricity. This investment being a third new investment with a different fuel source and different technologies would greatly benefit from a feasibility study. Of major concern at this point is the cost of the project. We are all still to see if the project will be completed in the desired time frame. As shown with the Bagas co-generation co project, delays in completing the project will also add to the cost. Currently, the overall cost of the project is projected to be $2.4 billion, or USD, $8 million per megawatt. That ends my presentation, and I would like to thank you all for giving me your attention. Thank you. And as I do so, I'd like to thank Isabel for the kind and gracious invitation. Thank um, Elizabeth for a warm welcome too. And to say that I'm really honored to be here and honored that so many of you have taken time out on your Saturdays to um, to join the, the, the meeting. Um, so thank you, Maury House, and thank you all. I've been asked to review the so-called um, gas monetization strategy of the government of Guyana. And then there is there's an assessment of the gas to energy project that was done by the international, I'll tell you the name just now, <laughs> um, pardon me. So we'll be going through both of those, um, hopefully briefly. Starting of course, with the gas monetization strategy paper. Guyana has a lot of gas, a lot of natural gas, well, a lot of associated gas slash natural gas. Um, in point of fact, if we were to consider that Guyana's 2020 power generation needs would be satisfied with um, between 30 to 50 million megawatts, um, million cubic feet rather per day of gas, um, and then to consider as well that in the Guyana Suriname Basin, according to the US Geological Survey estimates, there are about 37 trillion cubic foot of gas, cubic feet of gas, then Guyana actually, um, well, just 10% of this 37 trillion cubic feet of gas in the Guyana Suriname Basin. Uh, would represent about 200 to 340 years supply of electricity um, to the country. The Stabrook block itself has, I think it's about 17 trillion cubic feet of gas. So Guyana has a lot of gas. My only comment is that as we think about that gas and its potential to supply our energy needs for a long time, 
if we were to think even a hundred years, we should remember that that world in which we live will have to be a world, if it's going to be up to a hundred years from now, that would have met all the net zero targets that we need to meet. But Guyana has a lot of gas. That gas is a byproduct of the crude oil extraction that we're doing. Um, and it could either be, th there are a few things we could do with this gas. It could be re-injected to maintain what's known as reservoir pressure. It could be harvested, it could be evacuated and used, or it could be flared. So in the Liza field alone, um, reinjection is occurring, but in addition to the what's being reinjected, there's still more available, and I think it's about 50 million cubic feet would still be available for generating power. What I'd like to note as well too, this wasn't said in the gas strategy, but while the natural gas is a byproduct of crude oil, that's probably because crude oil commands the price that it now does. If instead that crude oil price were to collapse, we might find that the natural gas is more like a joint product than a, um, a, a byproduct. Gan has a lot of oil and we need to figure out what to do with it, a lot of gas rather. And that's the whole point of this strategy paper. Of note here is that the strategy paper addressed itself not just to 50 million cubic feet of gas that would supply the, the, the gas energy project, but rather to the vast amount of the resource that's available in the entire Guyana Suriname Basin. On this diagram that was updated very recently, apparently, um, it's from the the Petroleum Management Unit of the Ministry, Ministry of Natural Resources is a graph with um, a bunch of lines. The red lines indicate what's been re-injected um, into the reservoir to maintain pressure. Um, the gas that's been flared, well, those are red wiggly lines. The black wiggly lines, that's gas that's been flared. Over time, if you look at the, the horizontal axis, it's from 2019 actually through to the end of 2023. And um, the project is, is using gas. So that's the, the, the sort of mustard colored line there. You could see from the squiggles with the reds going up when and at the same time that the black lines go down and vice versa, that reinjection and flaring are negatively related, meaning that if you do one, you're you're not doing the other. Um, on November the twenty fourth in twenty twenty three, the amount that was flared was one hundred and thirty five million cubic feet of gas, and that was more than double the fifty million cubic feet that were required for power in 2020, according to the estimates. I note that the reinjection is a value to the operator, but it's free to the operator. Whereas flaring involves a cost, a negative cost to everyone at large, we call it a negative social cost, without any concomitant value or benefit to anyone other than the operator probably. So Guyana has a lot of gas. We need to do something with that gas. It can either be re-injected, it could be evacuated and used, or it could be flared. What's interesting is that the gas monetization strategy paper addresses itself primarily to the evacuation of the gas and not to the use of the gas. In other words, then, let's ensure that we could collect the gas, the associated gas that's being produced as we produce oil. We'll sort of figure out what will happen next, I imagine. So, so this strategy paper does not address the use of the gas, except for mentioning that markets will take care of this. It invokes markets and that the market for gas would be available to the upstream developers of the evacuation infrastructure to whoever 
evacuates the glass for us. It also acknowledges this um, strategy. While I'm saying that it doesn't really address itself to how we use the gas, it acknowledges that 50 million cubic feet will be available from the Liza field under the current um, gas to energy project. So what then does this gas to energy, uh, what then does this gas monetization strategy say if it's not about the use of the gas that's evacuated? What does it propose that we do up with the significant natural and associated gas resources um, that's beyond the 50 million that would be used in the gas to energy project? Well, it talks about investment in gas infrastructure, about the creation of a climate for gas infrastructure product, projects. Note, however, that the infrastructure for the gas to energy project is a fait accompli. It's already being created. So the time spent discussing what should be done in that regard probably um, is not that relevant. Um, it includes the physical infrastructure, that's to say the infrastructure for the gas energy project. It includes the physical infrastructure as well as the legal, contractual, and other institutional arrangements that must be, be in place for us to use gas from the Liza field to replace GPL's heavy fuel oil. Because the project is on the way already, as I said, this infrastructure either exists or it's evolving, or we can expect that it will happen. Even if all the infrastructure is not already in place, because the gas energy project is a government project and GPL as well as a state utility, it would be far easier to conclude all the necessary arrangements compared to an infrastructure that relied on markets and the private sector. My point being that this gas monetization strategy purports to address the vast gas resources in the Suriname Basin, and then it acknowledges the, ex but it doesn't really talk about how we'll use it. Um, it addresses itself to the gas to energy project, but I'm saying that if that's the use it contemplates, this already has been, you know, is on the way. As a reader reading a document like this, I think I should point out, as a reader reading a docu document like this, it became rather very confusing to know what really is the focus of attention here. I kept on asking, what is this gas monetization strategy proposing? It's proposing to incentivize the participation of players other than the incumbent, ExxonMobil, um, in the development of Guyana's gas resources. Beyond the arrangements for the gas to energy gas, the, the gas to energy project itself, the government of Guyana must attract private investors to provide the infrastructure solutions to enable upstream gas development in a timely, safe, and sustainable manner. And that's as far as it gets. The strategy notes, however, that gas developments are very comp so it's advocating this. It notes that gas development comp um, gas developments are very complex technically and commercially require specialized, dedicated infrastructure and complex value chains and commercial structures for monetization. To repeat, this strategy paper concerns itself not just with the gas for the gas to energy project, but the strategy paper does not address the contractual issues with the operator, you know, for the, 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 um, the, the larger amount of gas that's avail that will be available as other wells are developed, there will be contractual issues with the operator. Those haven't been addressed. The price of the natural or associated gas, which is now free to the operator, that has to be determined. That's not addressed. Presumably, it will be addressed under the production sharing agreement regime that's evolving. Um, and as I said before, the strategy paper does not consider and does not ex uh, you know, um, address itself to the use of the natural gas after its evacuation. So it presents this picture of us having a lot of natural gas and associated gas that we should do something about it, 
In the first instance, we should evacuate it and make it available. And then it sort of goes silent on the, the, the myriad complex arrangements that are involved even in the evacuation process because it envisages private investors operating in a gas field, a large gas field with an operator that in a more simplified version of things is providing the gas to the gas to energy project. That will not be the picture for the entire um, and vast resources that we have. Having failed to address the use of the gas resources, just saying, you know, it'll become available and we should prepare the infrastructure to ensure that we capture it or evacuate it. It assures that there will be a supply of this gas, but as I said, by not addressing itself to the use of it, be it export or otherwise, it's as if what we call in economics, sees law is at work in the minds of the author, that the supply will create its own demand. I like that phrase because it, it sort of mirrors what's happening a lot in many of the areas that have become available as we become more wealthy. There's so many things that we're doing without thinking for a second about consumer preferences, about demand and so forth. And I fear that with a gas monetization strategy, um, one is detecting something like this. Be that as it may, there is this very useful diagram and a useful discussion of this diagram. As you can see on the left there, there's natural gas all the way to the end, the left that could be used and converted into natural gas, liquid, steam, power. And then further downstream, um, as you see all the way to the right, you know, from below upwards, methanol, ammonia, hydrogen, ethylene and propylene, and, and um, you know, so forth. So there are many, many uses as depicted in this diagram. The one that was chosen was power generation, because for some reason, um, the document reverted back time and again to that particular use, and that particular use in the gas to energy project. So the strategy also, as a matter of concern, seems to discourage quite explicitly um, liquid natural gas exports after the evacuation of the gas. And I thought to myself, well, that's strange because we don't have any, we're silent in what we'll do with all of this gas that's going to become available as we extract oil. Um, but we're discouraging the exports. We know that we have the capacity, as I point out next, um, our power generation needs are, are not going to be, and this is the second document makes this point. Um, we would more than satisfy our power generation needs if we brought all that gas to shore. Guyana's power generation plans right now include the gas to energy, that's about 300 megawatts. Um, still on the books, especially in the GPL's expansion plan, um, is the conversion of its current existing plants to use gas, another 215 megawatts of electricity, hydroelectricity. I think by 2030, that's envisaged to be up to 620 megawatts. Then there's renewable energy, there's a Skelman, um, you know, co-generation plant. In other words, and this is the point made by the next uh, report that I review, the Guyana Gas to Energy project is unnecessary and financially unsustainable. unsustainable. Um, with all of this power that we're going to be generating from these various sources, it seems as if um, we, we're going to be, well, well we, clearly, we clearly can't bring all the, the vast gas resources to shore. Um, we probably should at least be thinking of exporting this gas. But as I said, this gas monetization strategy doesn't really envisage that. So turning to this second report, it's by the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis. Um, as Raul pointed out, there are four components to this gas to energy project, the pipeline, the um, fractionalization plant, the power plant, and the grid upgrades that need to inject 
that we needed to inject the additional power to the um, to the grid, the Demerara Burbis grid. Uh, the main components of the report that assess this IEEFA report um, are as follows. One, the GTE project, the gas energy project, it concludes would result in a substantially overbuilt electrical system. It will cost at least well, approximately two US $2 billion with expected financing from the US Export Import Bank it implies subsidies to achieve the 50% reduction in electricity tariffs. It will reduce the momentum towards 100% clean energy from renewables that was written into our, uh, our um, nationally determined contributions, as they are called. It will be cheaper for the government of Ghana to install every house with solar panels than to execute this gas to energy project. That's one of the conclusions of this report. And an ancillary point is that the gas to energy project seems to be a way of solving the operator's flaring problems. And by extension, solving the problem that we'd have on our hands when all these other wells with associated gas are operating. So I want to make some, um, some comments on those observations and the conclusions of the, the report. Starting first with this notion of an overbuilt electricity system, I agree with the view of the report. But I think it points out that, and that conclusion points out that coordination, something we're not particularly good at, will be very important. This is a point that Raul made as well. Um, that we'll be beleaguered by what we call time consistency problems that lead to policy reversals, we beleaguered, be beleaguered by these problems whenever, a, well, if it happens, a government changes or a policy maker gets a new bright idea or uncertainty in the execution of a project causes our plans to be derailed. Um, there are these, uncert there is, there's the uncertainty there's the time consistency problem, um, the potential policy reversals that will increase risk. All of these probably contributed, in my view, to our having an overbuilt electricity system. The second point that was made, or the other point that was made about the price tag, for me is also a concern, but not just because of the price tag, but because it it, 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 it includes this notion, and we've heard it publicly said, that if financing is not available by the US Import-Export Bank, um, the government will be prepared to finance the project from oil revenues. Um, later on, I'll point out that government decisions are not usually the same decisions that markets will make. In particular, the cost of financing and the choice of eligible projects to ref, um, usually reflect a market recognition of the importance, well, in this case, of energy transition and decarbonizing energy systems. So if the US import, export, export import bank decides either that the cost of financing will be too high for the project to be still feasible, or that maybe, given the concerns we have for um, the achievement of the net zero target, that there should be an embargo on any kind of financing of projects like these. In, in either case, um, we'd be left with the financing that is that doesn't take cognizance of market realities and environmental realities. In point of fact, very recently, the Biden administration has paused U.S. Um, liquid natural gas export authorizations precisely because of these concerns that you've got to get the cost of financing right, given energy transition that's occurring, given the movement away from fossil fuels. So I would add that concern to the mere concern about the price tag. Regarding the subsidies to electricity, there was noted in the report, the, the, the implicit subsidies. Um, well, the report actually dug, drilled down deep into the GPL capacity to 
um, to, 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 to manage things and to, you know, its financial capacity. So that was really very good because GPL will have to buy that generation, the, the, the power that's generated and transmit and distribute it. I point out a different concern though. Mine is that this subsidy would occur and would, be, would, would become necessary if ever the inefficiencies at GPL, which is a state-run entity, um, if ever those inefficiencies wipe out the cost benefits and the cost savings from generation of, of, of power at a cheaper rate from this gas to energy project, the, the, the consumer will end up paying a higher tariff anyway. So um, from that perspective, you know, there is no guarantee that the cost of of energy to the consumer will be two minutes, Doctor Singh. Okay, thank you. Will be will be much will be will be significant less than what it now is for the consumer. Um, I conclude with these remarks here. Using natural gas the way we propose and the way it has been proposed in the the, the, the strategy paper locks Guyana into a technology of the past. It, it fails to take advantage of the learning opportunities we have, um, let's say in the sugar industry, to pursue other forms of energy that would allow us to achieve real economic diversification. It seems to ignore the fact that carbon pricing is happening. And if Guyana produces using fossil fuels, albeit a cleaner fossil fuel, cleaner energy, our exports will still be um, probably confronted and faced by border adjustments for that very fact. Um, committing ourselves to this technology, you know, that's fossil fuel based is probably going to prevent us from embracing renewable energy uh, in the way that a Guyana of the future should. Um, the gas to energy project is another mega project that even, even if it's financed by government, it might, just as the Skeldon project was, it might be that that financing does not take account or prevents us from taking account of the real market risks and the uncertainty. Um, so we might end up with another project that cannot meet the test of the market, if you will. In a nutshell, I, I feel that Ghana's wealth must be used not to create a future of the past, but a future of the future. And I'm not too sure that the gas monetize, the gas monetization strategy um, is, is, is taking that future into consideration. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, everyone. And I shall Now we will um, look at the third speaker, the vacant seat, this vacant chair policy. Thanks, Isabel. You go. Ahead. Yeah.